Now, I would like you to meet our host, Chet Huntley. The other half of Huntley and Brinkley, tonight remembering veteran NBC newsman Chet Huntley. I'm Jane Pauley, and this is Time and Again. The following program is brought to you in living color. Ladies and gentlemen, a good evening to you. This is Lowell Thomas in New York. The Beatles of Moon, South America. Go, my fellow Americans! I'm Chet Huntley, your host on the end. 73 television cameras on Mayday Bell. President Nixon is actively... Most Americans get their news from television, and television news at its best was invented in part by Chet Huntley, half of NBC's unbeatable Huntley-Brinkley team of the 1950s and 60s. With a serious demeanor and devotion to the news, Huntley was one of the most watched, recognized, and respected journalists in television history. Tonight on Time and Again, we remember Chet Huntley, who died on March 20th, 1974. A Montana native, Huntley started in radio in 1933 when he was 21. He got into television back when hardly anyone in America owned a television, working in Los Angeles first for CBS, then ABC, then starting in 1955 for NBC. NBC News brought him east, and in 1956 teamed him with NBC veteran David Brinkley. The two not only dominated network news for the next 14 years, they set a standard for the new medium of television that remains unsurpassed to this day. On his own, and with Brinkley, Chet Huntley reported the events of the day during some of the most memorable days in American history. Let's begin in October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Good evening, this is Chet Huntley reporting. Tonight, report on Cuba, October 23rd, 1962. At 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, Eastern Daylight Time, the American blockade of Cuba becomes effective. The president issued his formal proclamation tonight. And he authorized Defense Secretary McNamara to use the Army, Navy, and Air Force in any manner necessary. 25 Russian ships are en route to Cuba on what may be a collision course in more than one sense. Chet Huntley did more than report events. He helped explain them, offering context and analysis, helping the viewer make an informed judgment. Here's how he concluded that report on the Cuban Missile Crisis. There are two aspects to this new crisis. First, there are the legalities and the moral issues. Second, there is the grim confrontation of raw and naked power. And as clearly as we are given to see the problem now, the choice is up to the Soviet Union. Whether resolution or easement shall occur in the area of legality and the moral issues, or in the area of power. It's an unhappy circumstance that such a deci decision should rest with the men of the Kremlin. Another disquieting feature is the realization that the Russians have so boldly and brashly and recklessly extended themselves this far in Cuba. It not only makes their retreat embarrassing and difficult, but it leads us toward the conclusion that they must be confident and that their Cuban adventure is more than a gambit. Well, fortunately, the lessons of recent history offer some optimism. In Iran, in Berlin, in Greece, in Austria, we have seen the Soviet Union back down before. The legalities and moralities will be argued in the UN, and to what conclusion we cannot foresee. Votes or expressions of support in the OAS, in NATO, in the UN, or wherever, are important to us in this area of non-force. However, if Khrushchev elects force, he has really then given us no choice at all for the world cannot forever endure this sort of Soviet pressure. It was the early 60s, the height of America's Cold War with the Soviet Union. Ten months later, Premier Khrushchev was again Huntley's subject in this biting commentary. The Khrushchev and Tito show featuring New Harmony and Marxist patter continued its tour of Yugoslavia today. Khrushchev delivered a speech in, of all places, Split. He was characteristically excessive, causing us to squirm in vicarious embarrassment as when he kisses and embraces Tito, takes off his shoes in the UN, or blows up a summit conference in Paris. He is forever like a short-skirted lady getting out of a small car, just a bit too much. He threatened to bury us again today, but with the careful qualification that he means to outproduce us with goods for happy workers and peasants. 
Significantly, he praised Tito for founding and developing an unorthodox strain of communism in Yugoslavia. He seemed to say that each country should produce its own homegrown brand of communism, as well as industrial goods for which it's best suited. Khrushchev is trying to rationalize industry of a communist bloc to fill in the numerous gaps and remove considerable duplication. He defined freedom today as access to good clothing and plenty of bread and meat. He uh, scorned the Chinese and indicated that Moscow's rule of the communist empire is to be benign and gentle. He was very jolly. It's been said that television news came of age with its coverage of the assassination of President Kennedy in 1963. It was television that helped hold the country together during that terrible time. On the evening of November 22, 1963, Chet Huntley reported the facts and held up sort of a mirror to America. It's a logical assumption that hatred, far left, far right, political, religious, economic, or paranoic, moved the person or persons who today committed this combined act of murder and national sabotage. There is in this country, and there has been for too long, an ominous and sickening popularity of hatred. The body of the president lying at this moment in Washington is the thundering testimonial of what hatred comes to and the revolting excesses it perpetrates. Hatred is self-generating, contagious, it feeds upon itself and explodes into violence. It is no inexplicable phenomenon that there are pockets of hatred in our country, areas and communities where the disease is permitted or encouraged or given status by those who can and do influence others. You and I have heard in recent months someone say, those Kennedys ought to be shot. A well-known national magazine recently carried an article saying Chief Justice Warren should be hanged. In its own defense, it said it was only joking. But the left has been equally bad. Tonight, it might be the hope and the resolve of all of us that we've heard the last of this kind of talk, jocular or serious, for the result is tragically the same. Kennedy's death turned out to be just the first in a series of almost unbearable shocks endured by Americans in the 60s. Less than five years after Kennedy's death, Martin Luther King was shot down on April 4th, 1968. Here's what Chet Huntley said that night. One city after another became the target for King's peaceful crusades. He didn't always succeed. There were many Negroes, particularly the young militants, who did not agree with him but his serenity prevailed in the midst of provocations that might have undone a lesser man. Such provocations were offered him and his people in Birmingham, Alabama, where dogs and fire hoses were used on demonstrating Negroes. And finally, four Negro girls were killed in the bombing of a church in September 1963. At a funeral for three of the girls, King had this to say, in spite of the darkness of this hour, we must not despair, we must not become bitter, we must not lose faith in our white brothers. His actions on the last day of his life indicate that he maintained a precious consistency to the very end. This country and every person in it suffered a terrible loss tonight with the assassination of this man. Again, we are made to look like a nation of killers at a time when our detractors and unbridled critics and adversaries had already advanced that damaging assertion. The perpetrator of this deed brings down upon all of us the painful charge that we Americans are prisoners of violence and destruction and death. What others think we are, however, is less important than what we are, and we are poorer as a consequence of this, farther away from our national goals and more prey to complete disaster, the disaster described in such stark language in the recent report of the President's Commission on Civil Disorders. Dr. Martin Luther King is victim of the violence he preached against and eschewed. This stirring and gifted voice of restraint is now silent, and we will find it difficult to argue convincingly in behalf of moderation. That is the tragedy of it. Restraint, gentleness, charity, virtues we so desperately need, have had a dark day. Among the dark days, there were days of triumph as well. On July 16, 1969, Apollo 11 lifted off for what would be man's first walk on the moon. The nation was caught up in the excitement of the moment. But characteristically, Chet Huntley's words were solemn and cautionary. At the same time that there is euphoria and triumph, 
there may also be a backlash of some disappointment. Because it may occur to us frequently that if we can correlate 22,000 flight steps and 9 million pieces of hardware and make them function as perfectly as all of this, why are we failing with some of our other problems? Therefore, Apollo 11 increasingly perhaps has become the symbol of a dawning suspicion that political, social, and spiritual excellence may not automatically follow technical achievement, that the two are separate. Many realize that our junkyards, the industrial slums and slag piles, the oceans of beer cans and the urban sprawl are fruits in one way of technological advance. But then on second thought, it may occur to us also that technology can ultimately be applied to yet clean up the mess, which are the disappointing byproducts of this same technology. So Apollo 11 causes us to think most of the 200 million of us are thinking, who are we? Where are we? Uh, is the universe our, our complete oyster? What about our priorities? Did the Russians by any chance in 1957 with Sputnik lead us into a series of bad judgments? Uh, is, it, is it good that we kind of cloak Apollo 11 with theological and metaphysical wrappings and second thoughts? For it might yet dawn upon us that a restrained, self-disciplined, and precise life journey here on Earth uh, could produce some comparable results. Restrained, self-disciplined, and precise, qualities characteristic of Huntley himself. The birth of the Huntley-Brinkley team in 1956, when time and again continues. Now, one of my partners here in TV One has been a reporter since 1937. He has covered politics from Washington for NBC for the last 13 years. David Brinkley's job will be keeping a running commentary on the convention. And a name we'll be hearing often is that of Governor Adlai Stevenson, who at this moment is holding a reception in Chicago's Prudential Auditorium for Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt. And with that, in August of 1956, the team of Huntley and Brinkley was born. The two would soon be anchoring the NBC Evening newscast name for them, but initially they were paired up to cover political conventions. Back in the days before those events had been reduced to made-for-TV infomercials. Here's how Chet Huntley raised the curtain on the 1956 Democratic Convention. We are in Chicago, where the Democratic Party will pick the one man it thinks should be president and the one man it thinks should be vice president. This is a party which, through the years, has thrived as a breathless coalition, a coalition of southerner and northerner, eggheads and gerrymandered slums, poor men and southern millionaires. And these diverse elements have a week to prove they're in unanimous agreement on a president, a vice president, and a platform. The drama will start in 17 hours, here. Twelve years later, in 1968, the Democrats were back in Chicago for a different sort of drama. The party was deeply divided over Vietnam. Police and anti-war protesters clashed in the streets and the smell of tear gas was evident in the convention hall itself. Chet Huntley and David Brinkley reported it all. Tension is building up again, downtown Chicago. Demonstrators outside the Hilton Hotel have taken up a new chant, send the troops home now, they're shouting. This is a reference to National Guard soldiers who now have replaced Chicago police in guarding the, uh, the official hotel. The demonstrators, some estimates are as high as 2,000 of them, have now reassembled in Grant Park across Michigan Avenue from the headquarters hotel. As you've seen and heard during the evening in our interviews on the floor, a great many of the delegates down here, or a number of the delegates down here, were seriously disturbed because they had seen here in the hall on television pictures of what we might call the Battle of Grant Park, the Chicago police and the peace demonstrators across from the Hilton Hotel and in the area of Balbo Street and Michigan Avenue. This is directly in front of what advertises itself as the world's largest and friendliest hotel, where at this hour, people stand around and sit in their rooms with handkerchiefs over their faces from the tear gas. And the Chicago police are arresting demonstrators. Watching chants the crowd on the side. There 
there's an odor of tear gas still left in the air here from tear gas shells that have been going off periodically for the last hours. The demonstrators have their own medical corps set up. Volunteers who wear white jackets and bring medical supplies to assist casualties. That's what's happening in the gutter there, out front of the Hilton Hotel. Well, I should think, David, what we've seen requires no comment. It's just unpleasant. Uh, go ahead. No, you're right. Let's I have see. nothing further to say about it. Chicago, 1968. When we continue, Chet Huntley looks back on the turbulent 60s in 1973. Chet Huntley had a ringside seat on the upheavals of the 60s. In 1973, in a special report called Strange and Terrible Times, he attempted to put those times in context. <laughs> There was the shock of it, but there was the strangeness of it, too. At a time of unparalleled affluence, dissent and demonstrations everywhere. An explosion of racial protest at a time when racial barriers were falling everywhere. people at war with itself on the issue of peace. America in the 1960s, a society in eruption. city should look like fortresses under siege. happening to America. What could one say but we're in the midst of strange and terrible times. One is pulled a dozen different ways in his mind and hardly knows what to think or do. Strange and terrible times. It's a vivid phrase, and few of us who have lived through the 1960s in America would dispute its accuracy. But those are the words of Walt Whitman, and they were written over a hundred years ago, in another time of riot, war, and assassination. Periods of turbulence will perhaps always be part of a restless, changing society like ours. But there have been three times in particular in the American experience when the foundation shook and the future of the Republic its very existence was in serious doubt. To look back at those other times of national ordeal may provide some perspective and reassurance in a period as puzzling and uncertain as our own. No trauma went as deep, no wound to American society was so nearly fatal 
as the events that Walt Whitman's words described. That was a time when government of the people, by the people, for the people, was in danger of perishing from the earth. So far tonight, you've seen a serious Chet Huntley. We'll show you a lighter side when time and again continues. Chet Huntley took his responsibility as a newsman seriously, but he didn't necessarily take himself too seriously. In 1963, he interviewed and played straight man to four British comedians, including Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, who had brought their hit show Beyond the Fringe to Broadway. In this winter of blandness along Broadway, four outrageous young Englishmen are nightly proving that satire, far from folding on Saturday night, can play to packed houses and uh, convulsed audiences. A few weeks ago, I watched these four gentlemen in their topical review, Beyond the Fringe at the John Golden Theater, and like thousands of others who have seen them, I was amused, provoked, outraged, delighted, and uh, ultimately exhausted. They are, in alphabetical order, Mr. Alan Bennett, who holds two degrees from Oxford, speaks Russian, and is an authority on Richard II, etc., etc. Mr. Peter Cook, a Cambridge man, a nightclub owner, and a magazine editor, etc., etc. Dr. Jonathan Miller, also a Cambridge man, a physician specializing in neurology and psychiatry, and an author and on and on. And Mr. Dudley Moore, holder of two degrees from Oxford, a distinguished pianist, jazz or classical, and a composer of notes. Mr. Moore, I wonder if you would care to uh, give us a brief explanation of cricket. How do you play it? How do you play it? Yeah. Uh, well, you have um, uh, a pitch of, what is it, 22 yards? 22, 22 yards. And at one end of it, uh, or both ends of it, there are three stumps um, bales with bales on top. Place uh, they, uh, about one and a half inches away from each other, and you, you stand there with a piece of good old English um, willow. willow and smite a, a leather ball that comes hurtling down to you, bounces once generally on the pitch, and uh, hits you uh, in the groin, in the groin. <laughs> <laughs> at which point you're, you're, you're out. <laughs> Do you detect any difference between American and British humor or American and British audience reaction to it? Just the audience reaction is more or less the same. Mm. Um, they may laugh at different things, but the volume of laughter is about the same as it was in England. By the way, do you find uh, this suspense becoming excruciating? That is, will Mrs. Burton let Richard marry Elizabeth Taylor? I'm remarkably calm, I think. Mm. I, I'm always interested I, in Liz Taylor's... Uh, I'm very interested in what Liz Taylor does <laughs> next, actually, because I always, I always <laughs> vaguely hold out hopes, you know, I think. Maybe she'll see the show. Maybe, maybe she'll come pop back. Around, yes. I pop around. When we come back, Chet Huntley returns to his roots in Montana and Scotland. Welcome back to Time and Again. Tonight, as we remember veteran NBC newsman Chet Huntley, who died on March 20th, 1974. Television producers will tell you that television reporters fall into two categories those who help carry the crew's gear and those who don't. Chet Huntley fell squarely into the first category, humble, gracious, and big-hearted. He came from the big sky country of Montana, born up near the Canadian border in 1911. His father's family was descended from President John Adams. His mother's father crossed the Great Plains in a covered wagon. Chet Huntley loved the American West and returned to it in 1962 for a special report called The Land. It was a subject close to home. This is Reed Point, Montana, where my parents now live. Its population totaled 65. I first saw this town in 1923, when it had a population of about 400. The town's boom period began in 1913. It prospered until the late 20s, when highways and the Depression spelled disaster. It sent its sons to war in the 40s and declined throughout the 50s. As farmers leave the land, the little towns suffer contract and even disappear. Weed-choked empty lots are the cemeteries of prosperous yesterdays, and even the grave markers, the old foundations and basements, are filled in and overgrown. Fifty years ago, more than half our people lived on the farm. Today, only one in eight remains. We have become a nation of city dwellers, but we are reluctant to acknowledge it. 
There is something about country lanes and burgeoning fields and the scent of new hay and bucolic 160 acres, which are a part of our folklore. By this dearly held mythology, we are blinded to a vast agrarian upheaval, as common to the south, the east, to the midwest, as it is to this little Montana town. Chet Huntley may have come from a little Montana town, but his ancestors hailed from Scotland. And Huntley visited there for NBC News in 1963. The half-hour program that resulted was a model of solid, serious journalism. But as you'll see, it did include Huntley getting fitted for a kilt. This, I suppose, uh, approaches a personal inquiry, but one that is made on behalf of the millions of Americans who make claim, authentic or no, to some slight derivation from this ancient land. This is Scotland. Loch Lomond and the men of the same name standing sentinel over it, the banks and braes, the heather and the highlands, the rills and rocks, the wee cottages and cozy villages are all genuine, just as it says in the book. Hello. Good afternoon. Mr. Laurie? Yes? I've been uh, sent to you. I am uh, vaguely interested in a kilt. Yes. What's entailed and uh, where do we start? Well, it's quite simple to start. Um, First of all, I must determine what tartan you want. Um, have you any Scottish association? Are you, you're your name? My name is Huntley. They tell me it has a Scottish association. Oh, yes. Um, Huntley is a very old Scottish name, and uh, it comes from the east of Scotland. And the Earl of Huntley, who's chief of Clan Gordon, takes his title from the, from the, the area of Huntley. Mm -hmm. So that you would be correct to, to wear Huntley tartan. Huntley Titan. Yes. Now, uh, what does it look like? May I well, see one? The basic Huntley Titan is very similar to this. Or alternatively, you could wear the Dread Garden Titan, which is this one. Well, what is it? Just a matter of choice, or does it depend upon the occasion? No, it doesn't you really. Wear? Normally, uh, that would be worn outside, and this would be worn for special functions. But it's not necessary. People would do wear this for both. Although normally they wouldn't wear that outside. Very good. But if I were making you a kilt, I wouldn't make it of this cloth. The kind of tartan you want is um, a worsted. Now, confidentially, Mr. Lorry, what should I wear underneath the kilt? That's entirely up to yourself. It's for you to decide. It's all a matter of choice. It is entirely a matter of choice. Like so many other pioneers of television, Chet Huntley got his start in radio in 1933. After four years in the Pacific Northwest, he headed for Los Angeles, joining CBS in 1939, then ABC 12 years later, making a name for himself in the process. NBC News hired Chet Huntley in June 1955. Given his expertise in foreign affairs, one of Huntley's first assignments was to comment on the Big Four summit of U.S., Soviet, British, and French leaders in Geneva. And now to Chet Huntley at NBC Los Angeles. History is, is standing by, in effect, with two test questions for the meeting at the summit. It may be too early to say definitely which test question it's going to be. One question is this. Did the meeting at the summit advance the chances for real peace, the kind President Eisenhower described in his address to the nation a few minutes before taking off for Geneva a week ago Friday night? Did the conference make any contribution to the thaw which had begun to touch the forward edges of the Cold War's great glacial reefs and barriers. If that question fails to apply, then we must test the conference with the other one. Namely, did it make any contribution to the strength, the durability, or the prestige of the West in the continuation of a Cold War? NBC News liked what it saw in Huntley and brought him to New York in 1956, giving him a regular program of his own, and that fall, launching him in what would soon become a national phenomenon. Chad Huntley, NBC News, New York. And David Brinkley, NBC News, Washington. And this is NBC News, the Huntley-Brinkley Report, assembled for television every weekday night by the world's largest and most comprehensive broadcast news organization, the news department of the National Broadcasting Company. Television networks still dominate the market for news and information, but not as completely as they did in the days before cable television, satellite hookups, and the Internet. And back then, the Huntley-Brinkley Report dominated network news. The program was serious-minded, all right. It even had the second movement of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony as its theme. 
Still, each program ended on a lighter note, followed by a sign-off that became an instant classic. And finally, it seems Coca-Cola is suing Pepsi-Cola in Britain, charging that the latter's new bottle is a steal on the Coke bottle. Barrister for the plaintiff argued today that the Pepsi bottle had suddenly appeared with a pronounced waste. Defense argued that all pop bottles have waste. And the judge observed, well, so do all ladies, but they're not all the same size. Good night, David. Good night, Chet. And so it went for 14 years, through the Cold War, Vietnam, civil rights, three assassinations, four presidents, and the social upheaval of the 60s, until the final Huntley-Brinkley report on July 31, 1970, the night Chet Huntley would retire. Chet Huntley, NBC News, New York. And David Brinkley, NBC News, Washington. That final program reported on a ceasefire between Israel and Egypt, the absence of any ceasefire between North and South Vietnam, and between blacks and police in a Chicago housing project. There was also a report on the trial of California cult leader Charles Manson. The country had changed in those 14 years. Through the day, Mrs. Kasabian detailed her nomadic hippie life in 11 communes in three years of indiscriminate sex, abundant drug use, and a search, she said, for love. Don Oliver, NBC News, Los Angeles. The kind of hippie living that Mrs. Kasabian talked about has been part of the Berkeley scene for several years. Now the police there are trying to clean out Berkeley's crash pads and particularly to rid the city of the teenagers who flock to them looking for thrills. For the young, Berkeley is where it's at. So they come here from all over the world. They travel light. Many are runaways, some as young as 10 and 11. On the surface, it's a carefree scene. Yes, that's a young Tom Brokaw reporting from California on that final Huntley Brinkley program. Eleven years later, Brokaw himself would be sitting in the chair Chet Huntley was vacating that day. We asked Tom how he remembers Chet Huntley today. Well, Jane, I suppose that I had a regional bias towards Chet Huntley. After all, he was raised the son of a railroad man in Montana and started his NBC career in California. I was raised the son of a man whose family owned a railroad hotel in South Dakota, and I began my NBC career in California. But Chet was so much more than just a Westerner. He was kind of a Mount Rushmore-like face. He was so consistent every night on the air. He read with such a sense of both gravitas, I think, and at the same time, a clear sense that he understood this country so well. He seemed to be one of us in a matter of speaking. He didn't seem to come from any elite salon in New York, although he lived here, and he had that wonderful, twinkly sense of humor. When David would get off one of his great lines and they'd come back to Chet and he would have that throaty chuckle and say good night for all of us at NBC News. I felt reassured, as I think the rest of the country did. It's a very, very important legacy what those two men did, and of course, Chet had such an enormously important role in it, and I remember the sad day when he left, and Huntley Brinkley was no more as an actual team on television, but of course, in legend, those two names will live on forever. Jane. Thanks, Tom. As the final Huntley-Brinkley report came to a close on July 31st, 1970, Chet Huntley spoke from the heart. And so, this difficult um, moment is here. In leaving this post after almost 14 years, I recommend to you the NBC nightly news which begins tomorrow. It'll be in the most capable hands of David, John Chancellor, and Frank McGee. I'll be watching with interest and affection. I might also remind you that American journalism, all of it, is the best anywhere in the world. I want to thank the entire staff of NBC for this nightly broadcast has not been an individual effort by any means. And as for you out there, I thank you first for your patience, then for your many kindnesses and the flattering things you have said and written. More difficult to take, to be sure, has been your criticism but that, too, has been helpful and, in most cases, valid. But you have boasted my conviction that this land contains an incredible quality and quantity of good common sense. 
and it's in no danger of being led down the primrose path by a journalist. At the risk of sounding presumptuous, I would say to all of you, be patient and have courage, for there will be better and happier news one day if we work at it. And David, thanks for these years of happy association and for being such an easy colleague to work with and for all the kindnesses. Chad had something else to thank David for. Back in the early days of the program, Huntley in New York was able to see Brinkley on a monitor carrying the feed from NBC's Washington station. Well, Huntley soon spotted someone else on that monitor, an attractive young woman named Tippi Stringer, NBC's Washington weather girl. Chet was interested. David made the introductions, and next thing you know, Tippi and Chet were married. We'll be right back. Although Chet Huntley left the daily grind of the anchor chair in 1970, he wasn't finished with NBC News. He began a series of special reports called The American Experience. The second, and as it turned out, final installment of the series aired on April 27, 1973, less than a year before Huntley's death. It looked back on some turning points in American history. The test of any society is its ability to survive shock and stress and still continue to change and grow. And by that standard, American democracy acquitted itself well in the ordeal of the 30s when collapse or revolution or dictatorship or ominous possibilities. Instead, there was a revival of the national spirit, the conviction that the American ideal was imperishable and would prevail. Like other ordeals of the past, the Great Depression hardened and unified the country. And when an even greater crisis came, when Americans were caught up in the strange and terrible times that engulfed the whole world, they were ready. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. We cannot escape history, he said. Lincoln knew none better that times of change and tumult are inevitable and that a nation must learn to use them to strengthen and renew itself. In another time of national ordeal, he told this story. It is said an Eastern monarch once charged his wise men to invent him a sentence to be ever in view and which should be true and appropriate in all times and situations. They presented him with the words, and this too shall pass away. And Lincoln added this comment, how much it expresses and this too shall pass away. And yet let us hope it is not quite true. Let us hope rather that by the best cultivation of the physical world beneath and around us, and the intellectual and moral world within us, we shall secure an individual, social, and political prosperity and happiness, whose course shall be onward and upward, and which while the earth endures, shall not pass away. That was Chet Huntley's final report for NBC News and the end of a 40-year career in broadcasting that nearly spanned the history of broadcasting. Chet Huntley died on March 20th, 1974 at age 62, denied the life in Montana he so longed to return to. That night, David Brinkley said of his former partner, I guess we and television grew up together. Now that part of it is over. And I believe Chet had every right to think he had left the American people something useful, honest, and of permanent value. Here's how competitor and friend Walter Cronkite reacted to Chet Huntley's passing. He was the same person, really, uh, in person as he was on the air, although I think like many of us, uh, uh, with a great deal more levity when he got off the air. Of course, uh, when he was dealing with serious subjects, he was a serious man, but he enjoyed life, uh, I think, to the fullest. And, uh, we had many very pleasant social moments together. Uh, he was a great fellow to be around. And, you know, we had a very intense rivalry over a long number of years. And when he and David were uh, in, in their deserved supremacy, uh, he never ceased to be gracious uh, about it. And uh, uh, none of our professional enmity, which was professional only, carried over into, uh, into our personal lives. I was a print journalist when he was already a well-known name on the West Coast. 
and I think that uh, we first met, I believe, at uh, uh, at the t about the time of, but I'm not sure it was at uh, one of the early atom bomb tests, 1951 or so. Let's see now if we can reach Chet Huntley, who was there with the troops, only two miles from the blast scene. Ch Chet Huntley, can you come in? This is the most tremendous thing I have ever experienced. And words are pretty puny and fragile things to use in an attempt to describe something of this nature. We were down on our knees in the bottom of the trench, braced against the forward parapet of the trench. The count came five, four, three, two, one, zero, and at that instant, a blinding flash of light uh, saturated us, and it hung on for just a second, it seemed. Then this trench dug into the face of this desert, danced around and jolted and lurched this way and that. Then there was a second of nothingness, and then that tremendous impact of the explosion which jarred us, it hits you in the teeth, it hits you in the bottom of the feet, it uh, wraps you on the head, and uh, you know that something has, has really happened. I think that's all for the moment. Now, once again, back to Walter Cronkite at News Knob. Chet Huntley, we couldn't hear you right here, but our engineers tell us that that was a great report, a report from the scene closer to an atomic blast than man ever intentionally has been before. Walter Cronkite and Chet Huntley in Yucca Flats, Nevada, March 1953. Some final thoughts from Chet Huntley when time and again continues. With Chet Huntley, what you saw was what you got, a newsman who was forthright, rigorously professional, and devoted to the truth. He also loved his country. In her brief odyssey through history, America has ventured from a sailing ship on an unknown coast to spaceships on the moon. From an offshore rock, a nation of explorers and frontiersmen has spread across a continent and beyond. True, the past was glorious. But in times of stress and tumult, the most rock-like faith can waver, and questions come. With the time of discovery long over and the frontiers gone, are the horizons closing in? Is the parade just about over? Will the old beliefs under challenge and the old ways changing? Is yesterday's heritage of any use for tomorrow? When there is unease and uncertainty, when people doubt and wonder, I think it's the poet and the artist, not the political leader and sociologist, who has the most to tell us. It was Thomas Wolfe, you know, who called this a fabulous country, the only fabulous country. And it was Thomas Wolfe who said, I think the true discovery of America is before us. I think the true fulfillment of our spirit, of our people, is yet to come. I think the true discovery of our own democracy is still before us. And I think all these things are certain as the morning, as inevitable as noon. Our America is here, is now, and beckons to us. I believe that. Chet Huntley once said, perhaps the best I might hope is that by some accident of voice tone or arrangement of words, I did on a few occasions excite, exhort, annoy or provoke a few of my fellow human beings to think. Asked what judgment he would like made of his life's work, Huntley hoped this would be said of him, that he had a great respect almost all for the medium in which he worked. He regarded it as a privilege, not a license. Chet Huntley met his standard and set one for the rest of us. That's time and again for now. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jane Pauley, and we're history. I really don't want to say it, but the time has come, and so for the last time, good luck and good night, Chet. Good luck, David, and good night for NBC. Thank you.